Lecture 14, Just in Time, Lean Operations and Maintenance. So a lean operation is a flexible system that uses significantly less resources than the traditional system. It's some of the benefits are greater productivity, lower cost, shorter cycle times, and higher quality. Another concept is just in time or JIT. It's highly coordinated system in which the goods move through the system and services are performed just as they're needed. So things arrive just in time. So here's some characteristics of lean systems. Waste reduction, continuous improvement, use of teams, work skip work cells, visual controls, high quality, minimal inventory, output only to match demand, quick changeover, small lot sizes, and a lean culture. So there's five principles that embody the lean systems. Number one is to identify customer values. Number two, focus on processes that create value. Eliminate waste to create flow. Produce only according to customer demand. And strive per, for perfection. So there's some benefits and some risks. So the benefits, you reduce waste, you lower cost, you increase quality, you reduce cycle time, you increase flexibility, increase productivity. So there's some big risks. First is increased stress on workers. So workers, it, when, when one worker, well, it takes a lot of work on the workers just to get this in place. And then it, if everything is just in time and one worker starts slowing down, everybody sees it. Fewer resources if problems occur. So if everything is just in time and everything is lean and you have a problem, then everything after that is disruptive. And then supply chain disruptions can halt operations. So if everything you're receiving from the suppliers are, is just in time, if there's some problem in the supply chain, everything after that shuts down. So this is how it started. In the mid-1900s, uh, there was something um, known as just-in-time. It, it was developed by these two guys at Toyota. The focus was eliminating all the waste from every aspect of the process. Um, and so waste is viewed as anything that interferes with or does not add value to the process of pr producing automobiles. So the ultimate goal of lean is to achieve a balanced system. So you have smooth and rapid flow of materials or work through the system. So there's three supporting goals that's, that's important for lean. The first is to eliminate disruptions. The second is to make the system flexible. And then the third is to eliminate waste, especially excess inventory. So waste is any unproductive resources. So there's eight sources of waste, excess inventory, overproduction, waiting time, unnecessary transporting, processing waste, inefficient work methods, product defects, and underused people. So Kaizen is the Japanese word for improvement. And so the Kaizen philosophy is attacking waste based on these ideas. Uh, so number one, waste is the enemy, 
and you really have to get your hands dirty to eliminate waste. It takes work. Uh, the second is improvement should be done gradually and continuously. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to make a big investment on consultants. It's, it's just gradually improve, continuously improve. The third is everyone is involved. Everybody at all levels is involved in this. Top management and the workers and everybody in between. So Kaizen is also built on a cheap strategy. How do you how do you do this cheap? How do you how do you make the improvements cheap and how do you save money with the improvements? And then the concept is it can be applied everywhere. It's supported by a visual system. You can see what's going on and what's needed. And it focuses attention on where value is created. It's process oriented and then the improvement should come from new thinking and new work style. So it's it's not we've always done it that way it's what would improve. And then the essence of organizational learning is to learn while doing. So it's very much hands-on. So the building blocks, you start with product design. So there's four important uh, elements in a lean system. The first is standard parts. So across multiple designs, you're using the same parts. And then modular design, and that's where you can mix and ma match pieces. We've talked about modular design before. A, a great example is a computer where you can put different size hard disks in, different amounts of memory. You can plug in external devices with USB. The, those concepts are modular design. Highly capable systems with quality built in. So the system is it can, can do a lot and quality is just part of doing the work and concurrent engineering. This is where the operation side of things or the manufacturing side of things is working with the design side. So design and operations are working together to make the system both mo both the design and and the process. So another thing is small lot sizes. So the ideal lot size is one. So the benefits of a, of a small lot size is you reduce in process inventory. So if you're moving from one station to the next and you so you do 10 widgets and then you move those 10 widgets to the next station and do 10 widgets and move it to the next station, then you eat between each station you have 10 widgets where if where if you have a lot size of one, then you would have one between each station. So that reduces in process inventory, which uh, reduces carrying cost and it's less storage space is necessary. And then inspection and rework costs are less when problems with quality occur. So if you're building this widget and you have a lot size of 10 and there's, there's say 10 steps, and you find at the beginning or somewhere in the process that there's a, a problem with quality and you have to fix it. If you have one at each station, then you'd only have 10. If you have 10 at each station, you'd have 100. So then you'd have to fix 100 versus fixing 10. It, it permits greater flexibility in, in scheduling. So when if you, if you can change things rapidly, then you can change what you're building easier. You have less inventory to be worked off before implementing product improvements. So if you decide on this improvement and you have a hundred things in the system, you have to finish off those hundred things before you start the new improvement. If you only have 10, you only have to finish off 10. You also have increased visibility of problems. So if if there's very little inventory between steps, then 
when step five in the process is slower, you'll, you'll see it bunch up there or people waiting there. And you also, it's easier to balance operations. So you can see which, it's much easier to see which, which operation is taking longer. Setup time reduction. So lot sizes and changing product mixes require frequent setups. So unless you can change the setup fast, um, that small lot size can be prohibited. So you want to have a deliberate improvement in setup times. So this, this one concept is single minute exchange of dye. It's, it's a SMED. The concept is when you're building something, you, you have a die there that's, uh, or a mold or something, and, and to be able to change to the new setup, should be, you should be able to change the setup at a workstation between widget one and widget two in a minute. So if you can reduce the changeover time across the system, then you could have widget one come through the system and then widget two and then widget three. Uh, grouping technology may be used to reduce setup time by capitalizing on similarities. Manufacturing cells. So one characteristic of a lean production system is multiple manufacturing cells. So a manufacturing cell is really a place where you're doing multiple operations all at one place. You, so, so a manufacturing cell, rather than going through a very long assembly line, a manufacturing cell would, would do the entire buildup right in one area. So some of the benefits is you have reduced change over time, you have high equipment utilization, and it's really easy to cross-train workers. Quality improvement. So quality defects during the process can disrupt the orderly flow of work. So autonomation, it's a really hard word, but the concept is automatic detection of defects during production. So this is where you def uh, uh, detect defects as they occur and you stop production to correct the cause of the de defects. Work flexibility. So here's some guidelines for increasing flexibility. Reduce the downtime due to changeovers by reducing changeover time. Use preventative maintenance on key equipment to reduce breakdowns and downtime. You cross train workers so they can help with when bottlenecks occur or other workers are absent. Use many small units of capacity, uh, many small cells to make it easier to shift temporarily or to add or subtract capacity. Use online buffers, store infrequently use safety stock away from the production area. And then you have reserve capacity for important cu customers. So balance system, we talked this talked the same concept when we were calculating uh, cycle time. In lean, it's called tact time. So the tact time is the cycle time needed to match customer demand for the final product. Sometimes it's referred to as the heartbeat of a lean system. And so the tact time is often set for the work shift. So you determine the net time available per work shift. If there is more than one uh, shift per day, you multiply by the net time by the number of shift, compute the tack time by dividing the net available time by the demand. So the tack time is really how often does a widget have to go flow uh, from one station to the next or flow, it's, it's that cycle time. 
process design, design uh, inventory storage. So lean systems are designed to minimize inventory storage. So uh, inventory tend to cover up recurring problems partially because they're not obvious and partially because the presence of in inventory makes them seem less serious. So here, here down here on the left-hand side, there's an example of a boat that's riding in the water. And see all these rocks under here? These are problems. And, and this water is represented by inventory. So you don't even see these problems. You're floating along, everything's great. You start reducing the inventory and suddenly all these problems uh, crop up. So now you can remove these rocks as problems and you see that the, the boat can float again because you've made these problems visible by reducing the inventory. Fail-safe methods. So poka yoka is fail-safing in Japanese. This is building safeguards into a process to reduce or eliminate the potential for errors during a process. So something we're all familiar with is uh, electrical circuit breakers. You plug too many toasters into one outlet, the circuit, circuit breaker blows. Uh, the reason for that is if you didn't have circuit breakers and you plug too many toasters in, it would overheat the wires in the wall and burn your house down. Seatbelt fastener warnings, you get in your car and uh, you start driving down the road and the seatbelt starts flashing at you. Uh, ATMs that signal if a, a card is left in the machine. Uh, so you uh, put your card in the machine to get your money out and then you walk away with your money and it starts sig signaling. Uh, designing parts that can be only assembled in the correct position. So there's two ways you can put it in, right side up or upside down. You put a little notch in there so it won't, uh, won't work uh, upside down. Personnel and organizational building blocks. So there's five elements that are important for lean systems. The first is workers are assets. Workers are very important. Uh, Cross-trained workers, teaching your workers to do multiple jobs. Continuous improvement, always improving. Cost accounting, this is where you're keeping track of the costs. And then leadership and project management. So now we're going to talk about manufacturing, planning, and control. It's, it's uh, MPC load leveling. So lean systems play, place a strong emphasis on achieving stable level daily mixed schedules. So you have a master planning schedule or MPS. It's developed to provide level capacity loading. Um, you have a mixed model scheduling. Uh, there's three issues that have to be resolved. What's the appropriate product sequence to use? How many times should the sequence be repeated daily? And how many units of each model should be reproduced in each cycle? So those are, those are questions that you have to answer. So there's two concepts, a push system versus a pull system. So a push system is what we're most familiar with where as soon as, so you start at the beginning, the first build something and they push it to the next station. And that once they get it, the next station uh, pushes it to the next station. And, and work is pushed forward. And that's a push system. A pull system is where a workstation pulls output from the the previous station as it's needed. So the output of the final operation is pulled by the customer or the master schedule. So it, it's, it, it works when the things can be done fairly fast. So you pull something out and then, 
everybody pulls from the previous station and they start building their, their piece. So pull systems are not appropriate, appropriate for all uh, operations. If there's a large variation in volume where the volume goes way up and way down, you probably want to somehow level that. If the product mix isn't quite right or the product design will undermine the system, there's, there's times when the pull system is not appropriate. Visual systems, there's something called Kanban. It's a Japanese word uh, for signal or visible record. So a card or some other device uh, demand, uh, uh, communicates demand. So a, an example is, is in, in your storage room, you have a st stack of paper towels and somewhere in there when, when it's time to reorder the paper towels, you have a little card in the stack that's close to the bottom, but not all the way on the bottom, and that card says how to reorder. So you're using the paper towels, you get down to that card, you take that card, you go reorder, and then when the stock comes in, you put that card in the same stack again. So the, the authority to pull or produce comes from a downstream process. So if someone is if someone downstream says they need something, that means you can go go get what you need. So there's there's a couple of types of kanban. One is a production kanban, which signals the need to produce parts, and then the next is a conveyance kanban, sig signals the need to deliver parts to the next work center. So here's an example of uh, Kanban in our kitchen. So if you look here, we have, let's just look down at the bottom here, these beans. So if you look here, there's, there's six cans of beans and the beans are always in that row. So when it's time to go to the grocery store, you look at that row and if there's two cans missing you need know that you need to put two cans of beans on your your grocery list if there's four cans missing and so this is a visual inventory system where you just know that's a kanban and and some of these over here like this one has tomato soup we only need three cans or i guess there's four cans in that pile of tomato soup and vegetable soup so it, it's a visual way of knowing how much you need. Limited work in prog progress. So one of the benefits of work, so work in progress is stuff that along the line that you're working on. So in the example before where you, you had a hundred things in process or 10 things in process. That's work in process. The, the benefit of having lower work in progress process is lower carrying costs. So it doesn't cost you as much of all that inventory that's in process. You have increased flexibility, uh, aids scheduling, and it saves scrap and re rework if the des design changes. And you have lower cycle time variability. Close vendor relationships. So lean systems typically have close relationships with vendors. Uh, they are expected to provide frequent small deliveries of high quality goods. So they're going to deliver exactly what you need when you need it. And another feature is there's a, a relatively small number of suppliers. So you find a supplier that works with you, that you like, and you stay with them. You don't jump around. Reduce transaction processing. So there's something called the hidden factory. These are all the things that are sort of behind the scenes. Logistical transactions, balancing transactions, quality transactions, change transactions. Those are all things that are, that are uh, they, they all cost, but they're not visible. So you want to reduce 
the cost of all this hidden factory as well as the visible factory. Value stream mapping. So a value stream mapping is really a visual tool where you systematically examine the flow of materials and information. So the purpose is to identify waste and opportunities for improvement. So, so if you think of a, a process, each step in the process should be adding value. And if it's not adding value, it's why, why are you doing it? So the, so the kinds of data that you collect, it, you collect the time. How long does it take at each step in the process? The distance traveled. So uh, sometimes you might have a layout where you, you have to walk down the hall and then you walk back to where you were or you walk across the office or walk across the, the factory and then come back. So distances traveled. Mistakes. So how often do mistakes happen and where do they happen and what could you have done to prevent that mistake? Inefficient work me methods. So Joe does it way faster than Sally. Well, let's look at the way Joe does it and the way Sally does it. Maybe Sally needs to learn how, how to do it the way, the way Joe does it. Waiting times. So there's two different kinds of waiting times. One is the product got there and the product is waiting for the next station. The other is the station is waiting for a product. And then information flows. Who, how is the information being, being moved around? So there's something called 5W2H. So 5W2H, it's the five W's are what, why, where, when, who, and the two H's are how and how much. So this is this is a method when you're when you're looking at a process, you're asking, what is this process doing? Why are we doing it? Where does it happen? When does it happen? Who does it? And then how is it done? And how much do we need? So that's a, it's a tool you'll see, you'll see a lot of times that they'll just use the, the term 5W2H. Lean and Six Sigma. So Lean and Six Sigma, a lot of times you'll see those two together. So Lean is, is streamlining the process and Six Sigma is increasing the quality, reducing the process variation. So what can happen is when you lean the system, you sometimes if you get it too lean, you can actually reduce quality. Well, if you're doing lean and Six Sigma, you're streamlining the system and increasing quality. So uh, lean is try, trying to speed it up and Six Sigma is slowing it down. They, they work well together. Uh, to achieve process flow and quality at the same time. So what do you do to transition to a lean system? So the, the most important part is top management must be committed and they know what will be provided. So if top management is not committed, um, it won't work. Then you decide which parts will need the most effort to convert. Uh, you obtain the support and cooperation of workers. You, you begin by trying to reduce setup times while maintaining the current system. So if you, if you start out by reducing setup times, that allows you to reduce your lot size. You gradually convert operations and you begin at the end. So at the very end of the process, you make that one better, and then you start working your way backwards. So if you be, if you started at the beginning and made that more efficient, you you would you would create this bunch in the middle where if it, it's sort of the concept of pull. So if you if you start with the last operation, make that really efficient. Now that uh, 
puts pressure on the next the ap last operation. So the the last station is sitting there saying, "When are you going to be done? When are you going to be done?" And and then that station you improve it, and then the previous station, "When are you going to be done? When are you going to be done?" And once once you have your whole process, then you start converting your suppliers to just in time. So your suppliers, you start working with them to say, how can we get what you're, you're delivering just in time? And there will be obstacles. So just um, be prepared for obstacles, expect obstacles, and figure out how to get past them. So here's some obstacles to conversion. First, the management may not be com committed and they may not be willing to devote the necessary resources to conversion. So if, if the management isn't committed, it'll start out great and then it'll just peter out. And then the other is if there's tension between workers and management, um, that can be a problem too. It can be very difficult to change the organizational culture to one that is consistent with lean philosophy. And then suppliers may resist as well. Now we're going to talk about maintenance. So maintenance is everything that you have to do to keep your facilities and equipment in good working order. So there's two Categories, one is the buildings and grounds, and then the second is equipment. So the goal is to keep the production system in good working order at minimal cost. So why do you want to keep the equipment and machines in good working order? Uh, to avoid production and service disruptions. So you have this one machine that does everything uh, say you're uh, a restaurant and you have one stove and the stove breaks down, you just can't serve food. You want to keep that in good working order. Uh, you, um, you don't want to add production or service costs. So, so if, if your machine breaks down, you have that worker sitting there doing nothing, uh, and you're waiting for it to be built. That's when when you have unused people and equipment. That's your costs are just going up. Maintain high quality. So your your this machine is is pumping things out, and suddenly it breaks, and it continues to pump bad parts out. And so suddenly your quality went down. And then uh, delivery dates. Uh, so you're, you're right on track to deliver the right number of widgets and suddenly your machine breaks down and you miss the delivery. So there are several consequences of breakdown. Operations capacity is reduced. Orders are delayed. Uh, there's no output, but overhead continues, which increase your cost per unit quality output may be damaged and safety you know what happens if your machine breaks blows up and break and hurts employees or or even customers maintenance options so you can do reactive maintenance or proactive maintenance so reactive maintenance is you wait until it breaks uh, and when it breaks you fix it Proactive maintenance is preventative maintenance. This is where you reduce breakdowns by doing lubrication, adjustment, cleaning, inspection, replacement of warm parts. So an example would be in a car where I'm just going to drive the car until it breaks down. So that's reactive. Proactive, I'm going to change the oil. I'm going to get uh, new tires when it's necessary, all, all those things. So I take care of my car, preventative maintenance. Total, total maintenance cost. So you can calculate how much it costs for, you, for a breakdown. So when a breakdown and you have to repair it, this is how much it costs. And then on the other side, preventative maintenance, this is how much it costs. 
So the optimum is you can add those two curves together and that low point in the curve is the optimum, optimal uh, cost. Preventative maintenance. So the goal is to reduce breakdown and failures in plant or equipment to avoid associated costs. So some of the costs are loss of output, idle workers, people waiting around for the machine to be uh, fixed, uh, schedule disruption, injuries, uh, the machine breaks and hurts someone, damage to other equipment, products or facilities, so the machine blows up and hurts the whole plant, and then repairs. So there, the way that you do repairs, uh, do you have an inventory of spare parts available? Do you have the repair tools and equipment? And do you have someone who knows how to fix the equipment? So a maintenance schedule, uh, you can have a periodic maintenance schedule where it's it happens every so many days and it can also be scheduled according to the availability of, of maintenance personnel or to avoid interference with maintenance schedules. So you might have a machine and you have a contract with the company where they come once a month, they come at five o'clock, you, you're using the machine nine to five, at five o'clock they show up, they maintain the machine every month based on, and those maintenance people are rotating between other, other places where they're maintaining equipment. You can also do some combination of maintenance. So you can have planned inspections to reveal the need for maintenance. And then you can do it according to the calendar or passage of time or predetermined number of operating hours. So an example of two and three is er, uh, every, I, I'm going to change the oil every 5,000 miles or six months or, or three months. So if whichever comes first. So I'm, I'm going along and I get to three months. I'm not to 5,000, but I'm going to go ahead and change it anyway. Or you can do it based on, uh, you, you get to 5,000 in just one month and you should go ahead and change the oil. So, so that's an example of calendar versus operating hours. So on cars, we use mileage as opposed to operating hours. Frequency. So the goal is to strike the balance between cost of preventative maintenance, cost of a breakdown. So if you can actually calculate uh, the, the function of expected frequency of breakdown and the cost of maintenance and the cost of uh, preventative maintenance. So here's an example. So the cost of a breakdown is $1,000 and the cost of preventative maintenance is $1,250 per month. The frequency of breakdowns without maintenance is shown in the chart below. So down here, uh, this is 0.2% of the time, or 0.2 or 20% of the time, it doesn't break down if you don't maintain it. 30% of the time it breaks down once, 40% of the, break, uh, the time it breaks down twice, and 10% of the time it breaks down three times. So that's the frequency of breakdowns. So if preventative maintenance is performed, the probability of machine breakdown is negligible. So it probably won't break down if you, if you do the maintenance. So then the question is, should the manager use preventative maintenance or would it be cheaper to repair the machine when it breaks down? So here's the calculation. So you, you start out by multiplying the number of times by this frequency. So 0 times 0 0.2, 1 times 0 0.3, 2 times 0 0.4, 3 times 0 0.1. So you multiply all this out and add it together to get a free expected number of breakdowns of 1.4. So one point, an average of 1.4 times per month is going to break down. So now you, you calculate the expected benefit of preventative maintenance. 
So you start out with the expected cost of a breakdown. So it costs you $1,000 and it happens 1.4 times per month. So that's $1,400. You subtract the cost of preventative maintenance, which is $1,250. So the expected benefit of preventative maintenance is $150. So if you do preventative maintenance, you will save $150 a month. Here's an, another example. Suppose the average time before breakdown is normally distributed with a mean of three weeks and a standard deviation of 0.6 weeks. If the breakdown cost averages $1,000 and preventative maintenance costs $250, what is the optimal interview, interval? So you, talk, so you have preventative maintenance divided by breakdown cost. So 250 divided by 1,000, that's 0.25. Find the number of standard deviations from the mean represented by the area under the curve of 0.25. So you have to go look in the normal distribution table and it's minus 0.67. So you use that value to determine the interval mean plus z which is uh, z is minus 0.67 time uh, which is uh, times the standard deviation which is uh, 0.6 standard deviation is 0.6 weeks and so that that comes out to be 2.598 weeks so if you maintain this or do preventative maintenance 2.59 every 2.598 weeks that's the optimal time to do preventative maintenance there's a reality there is is are you really going to do preventative maintenance every 2.598 weeks probably not but it's good to know that number when you're figuring out your maintenance schedule maintenance approaches so you, one approach is predictive maintenance. This is where you attempt, attempt to determine the best uh, to perform maintenance activities. Ideally, preventative maintenance would be performed just prior to a breakdown or failure because this is, will result in the longest possible use of equipment before a breakdown. And then the, another concept is total productive maintenance. So this is a just-in-time approach where the workers themselves actually perform the maintenance on the machines they operate. So if you're doing just-in-time, you can wait right up to the point where it's time to maintain it and the workers stop, they maintain it, and then they keep working. You can also do just-in-time where the, the worker has some slack or idle time, now they go do maintenance on the machine instead of being idle. So there's a couple of total ma productive um, maintenance approaches. Maintenance problems. Sometimes maintenance comes from the actual, uh, maintenance problems come from the actual design of the system. Sometimes it's just poor design. They, the, the designers didn't really take into account maintenance and sometimes there's more importance to other other factors uh, i i have some uh, so uh, cost or appearance are more important than maintenance activities i have some friends who have some really expensive cars and it's really hard to change the oil they have to take it to the dealer and it costs them a couple hundred dollars to change the oil and that's because the way they design the car, uh, the aesthetics and the way it drives is more important than where and in than how it, how easy it is to change the oil. So a lot of times, if you have a, a car that's really expensive to change the, the oil, you, you might want a maintenance contract where you just take it to the dealer, they change the oil. Breakdown programs. So there's a few approaches to dealing with uh, breakdowns, the use of standby or back, backup equipment. I had this car once that was getting old and the clutch was going out on it. It was, uh, and 
I used this approach where I had both an excursion which got poor mileage and then my car which got uh, good mileage but the clutch was going out. So what I did was essentially my excursion was the standby or backup vehicle and I kept driving that uh, that Honda it had 200,000 miles on it. The clutch was going out. It needed a new timing belt. And I was just going to drive it until it wouldn't drive anymore. And then once it wouldn't drive anymore, I was going to sell it. So I drove that car for about six months, knowing that at any point it could fail. And uh, sure enough, I was, I was driving to the doctor one day. Uh, it was on a bit of a hill and I just couldn't make it up the hill. Pulled over and I was about a block from the doctor. I walked to the doctor and then uh, I called my wife. She came in and got me. We called AAA, towed it home. And then I called the junkyard and said, come get my car. And uh, actually the guy at the junkyard said, well, I might want it. So, so he came and bought the car for $100. So that was an example of just drive it until it breaks. Uh, inventories of spare parts. Do you have an inventory of spare parts? Which parts do you have an inventory? Uh, you, you can use operators who are able to perform at least minor repairs on equipment that they operate. So a great example in the car is you should check the oil periodically. So in the olden days, when there was full service gas stations, they would check the oil for you. Now, when you get gas, you really should check the oil at least every other time to make sure that the oil doesn't run out. Or you can have repair people who their special their job is to repair equipment. They're available there to diagnose and correct problems. Replacement. So when re breakdowns become frequent or too costly, the question is what's the cost of replacement compared to continued maintenance? So you have an old machine, do you replace it or do you keep fixing it? So some of the issues, you have to be able to predict breakdowns. Sometimes there's a technological change where that in addition to the cost of breakdowns, you may actually get improved productivity. You have system disruptions with the breakdowns. Uh, if you buy a new machine, you might have to train your employees on the new uh, equipment. And then what's your fat forecast for future demand? If your demand is falling, uh, you might want to just keep the old machine and, and just have a little bit of an extra inventory so that it, it, you're, you're able to get less and less out of that machine, but your demand is falling, so, so it's okay. So there's the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule and maintenance. So what you do is you take into account the degree of importance of each piece of equipment and the ability to operate without that equipment. So What's your most important piece of equipment? That might be the piece that you want to maintain. Where some other piece of equipment that you only use periodically and it's not that critical, maybe you just let that break down and fix it when it, when it breaks. So uh, a few pieces of equipment are extremely important and they justify considerable effort and or expense and some are moderately important so that's like moderate effort and expense and then a bunch of stuff you just do minimal expense to maintain it. So a summary. So this lecture we've covered the building blocks, uh, the product design, process design, personnel organizational elements, manufacturing planning and control, talked about value stream mapping, the 5W2H, what, why, where, when, who, how, and how much. We talked about the interaction between Lean and Six Sigma. We talked about what it takes to transition to a Lean system. 
And finally, we talked about maintenance.